Hey, I'm Dr. Wilson. I'm a PhD molecular biologist and welcome to another COVID debunking video. Now, recently I was asked by several of you to cover a particular episode on a YouTube channel called Trigonometry. Apparently in it, the hosts interview this guy who is in his early 20s and has absolutely no experience or expertise or background at all in science or biology. So I'm thinking, why would I cover this? Surely that many people can't be listening to, oh my goodness. Okay, so this is a pretty big YouTube channel and the video has quite a lot of views. So, all right, I'll listen to it and I'll let you know what the science says about whatever they have to say. Let's get started. Then I started to go deeper and deeper into what was going on and I was very alarmed um, at how many vaccine injuries I was hearing about, particularly the myocarditis in, in younger boys, younger men, um, the heart inflammation and the absolute gaslighting on that specific topic. All right, so maybe it's a good thing that I'm covering this because this talking point has caused way too much disinformation about COVID vaccines, and it bears repeating why it's wrong. So this guy Rob here, his major sticking point seems to be this idea that COVID vaccines are causing more harm than good, and he mentions myocarditis as a reason for that. The reality is that the question of whether or not a vaccine or any medication brings benefits that outweigh its risks is a valid question. And since scientists ask and answer questions for a living and the scientific community is a global community that spans governments, ideologies, institutions, etc., they've asked and answered this question pretty convincingly. The answer is that the benefits hugely outweigh the risks, but this answer is often lost on people like Rob, in my opinion, because they are probably asking the wrong questions. They might think that because COVID vaccines cause myocarditis and that because he's young and healthy, that means that he doesn't have to worry about COVID, so why give himself the risk of getting myocarditis by getting a vaccine? Well, it turns out that not only is myocarditis more likely to cause you more problems if it comes from a virus than the vaccine, but the virus also causes a lot more problems outside of myocarditis that the vaccine has practically no chance of giving you. The virus, SARS-CoV-2, can increase your risk of getting a blood clot. It can increase your risk of getting a heart attack. It can increase your risk of getting so sick you have to go to the hospital, and you could die from it. Yes, even if you're young and healthy. In case you don't know it, let me give you a short background on myocarditis before we go any further. Myocarditis is an inflammation of the heart muscle. Myocarditis does come in many forms. It can be mild such that you might never even know you had it, it doesn't cause any long-term effects, and it resolves on its own. It can be mild but still bad enough where you notice it and you go to the hospital, but it still resolves on its own. It might also be on the more mild side, but it's to the point where your doctor gives you medication just to make sure that it doesn't get worse. And then you have the severe or fulminant cases, which most often come from actual infections from viruses or bacteria. So while all cases of myocarditis are not trivial, this severe fulminant form is what you really have to worry most about. And it's extremely rare following vaccination much more common following SARS-CoV-2 infection. So keep that bit of background in mind when we go through these numbers because not all of them are broken down by mild versus serious cases. So let's look at the numbers that Rob and these hosts might be missing here. First, let's start just generally. Are you more likely to get myocarditis from a vaccine or from SARS-CoV-2? The answer is SARS-CoV-2. The estimations do vary, but all of them show a much higher risk of myocarditis following SARS-CoV-2 infection than vaccination. So in the general population, if you're just looking at myocarditis, it is already apparent that the vaccination is going to carry less risk than SARS-CoV-2. And the other bit of good news is that if you're vaccinated against COVID, then you're less likely to get myocarditis following infection. But I know Rob is particularly concerned about his age group or just younger, healthier people in general. So what are the risks there? Well, he's a little bit out of this age group by now, but the age group that is most likely to experience myocarditis following COVID vaccination is adolescent boys, about ages 12 to 17 years old. And the risk is greatest following a second dose of Moderna's vaccine rather than Pfizer's. When we look more broadly at hospitalization and ICU admissions caused by SARS-CoV-2 and compare that to cases of myocarditis caused by COVID vaccination, in this young and healthy age group, then we see that vaccines carry much less risk than infections, and that SARS-CoV-2 does in fact cause 
a significant number of hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and yes, death, even in this age group. But I know Rav might ask, well, what about healthy kids? Surely all these kids who are getting hospitalized and admitted to the ICU and dying are unhealthy, right? I'm not sure why that would lessen their suffering, but we can look at that too. And we can see in this study that 30% of the kids who were hospitalized for COVID had no underlying health conditions. And 9 out of 10 were unvaccinated. So no matter how you slice it, COVID vaccines are bringing more benefit than risk to any age group, no matter how healthy you are. To understand this and then actively choose the road of taking more risk doesn't make any sense. You know, a few months into the pandemic that COVID was a serious problem for over overwhelmingly elderly and obese and immunocompromised people. Everyone other than that, people like myself, people like yourself, assuming you don't have, assuming you're not dying tomorrow, hopefully not. <laughs> Um, it, it it was not the level of problem that it was being portrayed in the media. Ab absolutely not. There are over 6 million confirmed COVID-19 deaths all over the world, but the true number is closer to 20 million deaths. I guess that's not a big deal for him. I'm not trying to tell you this, Rav, but pretty much every infectious disease is going to have a greater effect on the more elderly or more vulnerable populations. That doesn't mean they can't also impact the lives of healthy young people. And again, death is not the only bad outcome that you can get from COVID. And vaccination reduces the risk of all those bad outcomes. Ultimately, all this misinformation is leading him to actively choose a path of more risk. There's one study that was published in um, the scientific uh, journal uh, Nature, and that, that I think that is one of the most interesting uh, data points which showed, this is MIT researchers and um, Dr. Retsif Levy um, led the study, and he tracked um, 911 calls um, before and after and during the distribution of the vaccine. So now we're going to start to get to the problem that people like Rav have. They do think that they're listening to the science. They do think that they're looking at the data, but they're not. They're just repeating the talking points that other contrarians have said and lazily using that to support their argument rather than honestly looking into the scientific literature, which to be fair, is harder to do. So what paper is he talking about here? This is an awful paper that was published a while ago. Several experts have already commented on this paper and pointed out just how bad it is. So I'll just give you a couple cliff notes here. Number one, this graph that is always shown with it appears to show a correlation between vaccine doses and calls made to emergency centers reporting cardiac arrests. However, if you actually extract the data, like epidemiologist Gideon M.K. did, you can see that this correlation actually doesn't line up to vaccine doses at all. It falls more in line with just emergency calls. And another kicker here is that when you look into who was making those calls, like actually gather some evidence about them, including were they vaccinated? Most were not. So how could it be the vaccine causing these cardiac arrests? It wasn't. And if people like Rav bothered to actually look at the scientific literature instead of lazily repeating what the contrarians say, this would be abundantly clear. When it comes to just straight-up excess deaths, the more vaccinated a country is, the fewer excess deaths they have. That's because they're preventing a lot of COVID deaths. You can track timing of vaccine doses with these excess deaths and see that they don't line up. If you want to stay granular with it, you can also just look at total cardiovascular deaths or even myocarditis-related deaths in the U.S. and see that the correlation fits more with COVID than it does vaccines. But if you want to get super detailed about it, you can look at the specific population-level studies that have been done all over the world, looking at the safety of vaccines after their rollout. And all of them will show that COVID vaccines are very safe and very, very rarely cause serious side effects that can result in very bad outcomes. There is just nothing in the scientific literature that can support the idea that COVID vaccines carry more risk than benefit. And again, this is not this is not everyone. It's still, if we're talking about risk ratios, it's something like one in 2,000, one in 3,000 risk of myocarditis in young people. Nope. The highest estimate is five in 100,000 persons vaccinated. Again, those risks are much, much lower than with infection. They published this paper in Vaccine uh, last year, reanalyzing the initial Pfizer and Moderna safety trials and looking at serious adverse event rates. And they found an adverse event rate of 1 in 800 
for the trials combined, Pfizer and Moderna. And that is orders of magnitude higher than any other vaccine that we've ever seen, according to their analysis. This is another really bad paper that was published a while ago. Several other science communicators have covered it, so I'll put their links in the description. But just to give you the cliff notes again, this is a paper that looked solely at the randomized controlled trials and tried to reanalyze the data. Disregarding all the things that ended up being wrong with that analysis, again, go check out the links in the description for more on that. It's really dishonest to look only at randomized clinical trial data and not the vast amounts of phase four surveillance data that was taken as the vaccines were rolled out to the population. Those phase four data are actually going to be a lot better when you're trying to estimate the rates of severe adverse events and especially good at estimating the rates of rare severe adverse events. The reason being is that when you have tens of thousands of people in a randomized controlled trial, you might not catch adverse event rates that are in the one in a million range. But when you roll the vaccine out and you give over 13 billion doses worldwide and you monitor the safety of those doses across the world and you come up with several reports and papers publishing those results and all of them find very low rates of severe adverse events, then why focus on the randomized controlled trial data? The answer seems to be they just throw it out because the answer doesn't agree with what they want to show. That doesn't sound very honest to me. The 1976 uh, swine flu vaccine was pulled for a 1 in 100,000 uh, serious adverse event rate. That's also not true. The 1976 flu vaccine rollout was stopped because it was realized that it wasn't very needed because the flu strain that year was not nearly as bad as what people predicted. But that didn't stop contrarians from saying it and then having people like Rob repeat it on whatever show they go on. And, that, and that's not just myocarditis, it's menstrual irregularities. Menstrual irregularities are caused by multiple things and often cycles return to normal. That's the case with COVID vaccination. There's no evidence at all that this causes any defects in fertility. Because there's been some new reporting on potential retinal issues you know, with, with eyes and whatnot from the vaccine. Nope, that's been looked at too. And there's no evidence that the rates of retinal vascular occlusion, which is what he's talking about, is any different when you compare vaccinated to unvaccinated groups. You see, the reason I'm able to like speed run his claims now is because I've heard them all before. He's just repeating them from the contrarians that he thinks are the experts in their field, except the experts in their field don't consider them experts in their field. From that you know, total number, it's not all from COVID. It's about 30 to 40% of those cases are absolutely incidental. And some of those cases that are logged in as from COVID are actually suicides and homicides. Uh, Justin Hart on Substack has logged some of those CDC cases that well, you know, people die of a suicide, test positive for COVID. And again, it's, it's like, I look at that and I'm like, please tell me that's wrong. Please tell me that that is, someone can debunk that as misinformation. Yeah, no, it was it is. yeah, happy to debunk it. I've been doing it for years now. A COVID death cannot even be considered a COVID death if the cause of death was not natural. That's it. There's no long-winded story with a punchline to debunk that. It's just a simple fact that Rob and the hosts haven't bothered to look up. There's more and more data coming out. There's a recent study in South Korea that proved beyond a doubt, and we already kind of knew this, but this study really concretizes that there are, you know, potentially hundreds or thousands of people that did die from the vaccine, from sudden cardiac um, arrest, from, from any kind of cardiac complication. Oh, finally, he cites a good study, but he misrepresents it. What a shame. This nationwide study that came out of Korea actually had pretty reassuring data. It showed that out of about 44 million people vaccinated in the Korean population, there were 95 cases of severe vaccine-related myocarditis. That's a rate of 0.0002%. So no, there's no evidence in this study that his idea of hundreds of thousands of cardiac deaths caused by COVID vaccination is even remotely true. And no other country supports that either. However, unlike Rav, I'm going to look at this paper and say, what can we do to help fix this problem? Because even with a rate of severe myocarditis being that low following a vaccine, we want to get it even lower. We don't want people to suffer, and we want to be able to prevent suffering as much as possible. So if you are worried about myocarditis following a COVID vaccine, what can you do? Well, I said earlier that the biggest concern comes from 
a second dose of Moderna. Well, one thing you can do that plenty of research has backed up is space out those first and second doses even further than four weeks. It's been shown that if you space the doses out more on the order of eight or 12 weeks, then not only are you less likely to develop myocarditis, but you also get a better immune response because spacing out that time between that first prime and that boost in the second dose gives you a better immune response. Another thing you can do is instead of getting Moderna for that second dose, you can instead just get Pfizer and lower your risk that way. So if you do both, space out those first two doses and opt for Pfizer instead of Moderna, you're going to reduce your risk of myocarditis following COVID vaccination. Those are two solutions that science has given us. And instead of being like Rav and being so afraid that you spread disinformation to make yourself feel better about your decisions, you can simply look at what science has to offer us because science is constantly showing us not only the safer path, but trying to make the safer path even safer. Yeah, I mean, long COVID is very complex and it's there's been a few studies done. Dr. Marty McCary has written about this, Johns Hopkins researcher uh, at, the, at the Wall Street Journal, looking at the best studies on long COVID and there's no clear indication of, you know, infection versus getting long COVID. And the, the best correlate that they found is people who are prone towards, wait for it, anxiety, psychosomatic issues, people more prone to, to worrying, to overthinking things. I'm sorry, is he saying that long COVID is psychosomatic? Wow, no, long COVID is not just psychosomatic. This has been very well studied, that it is a real phenomenon that a lot of people suffer from. If he wants to just deny their suffering, then yikes, he's got a lot of priorities to fix. You know, this, this is why I think many people should stick to kind of what they really know. Now that is irony. All right, well, that was certainly something. Yikes. Another victim of disinformation chasing internet clout. Real shame. Anyway, that's going to do it for this week's video. I do hope you all enjoyed it. And as always, all the links to all of the science that I talk about are in the description below so that you can read them for yourself. And of course, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe if you want to catch me next week, where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then. Thank you.